Aloha, and how you doing? Welcome to Hibachi Talk. This is Gordo the Texar. By myself today. Well, me and a half. So uh, Andrew's out uh, uh, s- snowboarding, the lucky guy, and I'm here. So I got Angus going to keep me company, but he promised he was going to keep his mouth shut. Well, it's open now, but he's not going to say much. Anyway, we got a little bit of a different show today. No guest. Um, I've been asked... Um, to do a little talk, a little story, but please grab yourself a towel and a libation, and sit down, and uh, join us right here now for a few moments in Hibachi Talk Land. Anyway, I was asked by a few people to talk about um, how how uh, yeah, I was perceived to become so successful, and um, and a lot of people know that when I moved to Hawaii, I had 500 bucks. That was it. That's all I had, nothing else. And 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 then over the over the years, uh, been able to uh, become you know pretty comfortable in my lifestyle and such. So there's really eight things that kind of helped me get there, and they're really life you know, life moments and what, what, what helped. So I thought what I'd do today is i just kind of walk you through it and hope that you'll uh, take note of what these eight are. And I'm, I can almost, I wish I could say I could guarantee you, but it certainly worked for me. If you apply these success factors in your life, there's a high probability that you will have a very good and happy and rewarding life. So let's talk a little bit. We'll start at the beginning. So I, I grew up unbelievably poor and people would not realize how poor I am but let's go back and we'll take a look at my mom and dad and see and go to start there so my father was my parents were born in Edinburgh Scotland so and my father was an orphan and he was born uh, uh, an orphan and left at the orphanage and his on his birth certificate um, and so well let me back up a little bit so he was born there uh, my dad was barely five feet tall and my mom was 4'10". So I'm a giant in the family at 5'8". So um, they're, they're, now they have great grandchildren that are in their six feet, so there was something happened. Yay McDonald's, I'm not sure. But anyway, so they, you know, they um, had an interesting, interesting lives themselves growing up, but my father more, more than, than perhaps my mom. So my father was dropped at the orphanage, and um, this haunted him for his entire life. And I got a picture here, we'll show you, of, of his birth certificate. And on his birth certificate, has written the word illegitimate. And I don't know how you would feel if you had a birth certificate and on it, it had the word illegitimate, which means you're not allowed. And the, the Scottish term that he would use all the time was bastard. And um, that stuck with him for his entire life. As long as I at least knew with him, it always haunted him. It haunted him so much that he even, um, when he was 20, and I found the letter, wrote a letter to the um, uh, government of, of Scotland and asked them to change his birth certificate and remove the last name, which was Larkin, to Bruce, the one he had chosen. And they refused to do it. But that's how much it kind of haunted and played with him uh, his entire life. Now, he never got out of grade school. He never went to high school. Um, he, uh, he was a, uh, a desert rat, fat, fought, in fact, in fact, fought during World War II in the Sahara Desert. Um, so, you know, he had a very interesting, interesting background. Grew up entirely in the orphanage. He had a woman that kind of take, took care of him. Her name was Bruce. Last name was Bruce. And so that was the name and the reason why he picked it. Now, my mom, on the other hand, she was a single, she, she, she had her mom and dad, but she was the only, she was an only child. So she didn't have any siblings. So she had that kind of an upbringing. So you've got, you know, my father on his side. I got my mom on, on her side doing, doing um, their, their different kind of family upbringings and such. Both one thing they had in common was the military. My dad was, like I said, a desert rat, British eighth. My mom was a wren in the uh, uh, British Navy and, um, and did that as well. So they went through, through those scenarios together. And then in, uh, in the late 40s, they, after the war, they moved uh, to Toronto, to Canada. And when they moved to Toronto, and Toronto back in those days was uh, farmland. My father was going to go work on the farm. He was a, a truck driver. He, that's what he was, his plan was to do. And I'll get a little bit into that and so on. But, but um, they come to Canada. They start living there. And um, they have, uh, end up having three sons, of which I'm the oldest. And they have, they have the three boys. Now, the three of us are, I mean, we're talking about dirt Poor. I mean, you can see by the photo here. Um, this was a. This was on the farm. This was a farmhouse. We um, we uh, spent a lot of time uh, in that place, living it. We had no running water. We had no um, in-house toilet. Uh, none of that kind. None of that kind of thing. Um, it, it, but you know, we were very proud. And and so let's so let's talk about you know this you know. The, the success factor. So the first one I talked about was, you know, never take credit for successes, and, and, and we never did for all the time that we came along. The other one is, like, this honesty and, and integrity. And so, you know, 
that my father and mother instilled that in us, but they had no concept on how to raise kids, but they knew that honesty and integrity was important. It was very, very, they were very, very strict. Um, uh, there was two ways of discipline. One was a strap and one was boxing gloves. And so my father would sit down um, and it would be one or the other if we did something wrong. Either we get the strap or we would get, we, we get to go fight with dad. So, and that concussion number one, as I can still remember it, right between the eyes and I was out like a light. And I must have been six or seven at the time. You know, in this day and age, that would be considered, you know, um, uh, uh, really not good, um, but back in those days, that was how we handled those kinds of things. So, um, um, but talking about how, how, how poor we were, I mean, we only bathed once a week, and I'm just trying to imagine now bathing once a week, and with three boys, and it was in a big cast iron tub, and with three boys, my mom kept a log on who was the first one in the tub the week before. So that meant every fourth week, you'd be the first one in the tub. So I can still remember sitting in the tub as number three the third time because um, we'd use the same water uh, with a scudge floating around the top with clothespins floating around the top. And that was, that was how, that's how we got bathed. That was just how it was. There was just, there was just no other way to do it. The, the well was a long ways away and, 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 and things like that. So we bathed once a week. The other thing I remember, and, and it's, it's one of those things that will stick with me, is uh, dentists. And I had toothaches my entire life. And um, we didn't have, the dentist was the barber. And I didn't realize that that was really what it normally was in those days, is that the dentist was the barber. And, the, and um, you would go to the dentist to have your teeth pulled. There was no such thing as filling. And the guy in front of you would be getting a haircut, and then you'd sit next, and they'd take your teeth out because you had a toothache. It was, it was, that was the way it was. And that was it. Case closed. There was no Novocaine, no nothing to dull it or whatever. You just went in and they just yanked it out. And you didn't dare cry because there was no way that would be allowed. So, um, so you know, the, we never owned a home. My parents never bought ever owned a home. Uh, we never had a new car. And our meals were pretty much standard throughout all the time. You know, the, it was, um, we always had enough money to have uh, roast beef on Sunday because that would keep us going for a few more days over the course of the week. So, um, and then on uh, Wednesday was bread and gravy. I still remember that very well. For years, I thought mushrooms were meat because with the gravy on them, they kind of taste like meat. So I, and we'd have mushrooms and carrots and car oh, I hate carrots. They would cook carrots till they were mush. And it was, just, oh, I just can't stand looking at them now. But anyway, that was, you know, the, but, but that still, still during those times, we just held our integrity, we held our honesty, and we were very proud to be what we were, what we were, what and who we were. And now, now the next thing I want to talk about is what goes around comes around over time. And this is really an important thing is because over time, um, I believe what you do now and what you do in this present that the next time down the road, something will happen you know, positive in your, in, in your favor. And I'm going to give you an example of one. So here's a picture of, of my brothers and I. Um, I think I'm about, oh, eight at that point in time. We had uh, strabismus, crossed eyes. Our eyes were like this. My father used to say, and I'll do it, I'll do it in his Ang Angus accent, he used to say, you know, you guys are going to be good taxi drivers when you get older because you can see across the road at the same time. But we had these eyes that went everywhere. And... Um, and uh, there was a, a public health system in uh, Canada, and um, the Sick Children's Hospital said we wanted to do, um, uh, w w which was then a state-of-the-art surgery. And they did surgeries on my brothers and I and uncrossed our eyes. Now, to do it back in those days, they literally took your eyeball out of your head and did muscle changes and then put them back in. So I had ended up with a couple, my other, one of my other brothers ended up with a couple of them. But that's how they did it back in those days. There was no laser, those kinds of things. We were in the hospital for well over a week. Um, and it ended up that the surgeon that did this work ended up being the eye doctor for the National Hockey League. So that, that leaped him to, into that space. But my point on this, you know, what goes around comes around is that, you know, these kinds of like hardships or little, what you might consider hardships, oh, poor me. We didn't even look at it that way. And I remember one time, and I think it was for this, we went to get this photo taken. Um, we had to take the bus for two and a half hours to get into town from the farmland. And I don't know what I was doing. I was agitating my mother so much. Um, I, I can still see to this day, the broom coming around from the side and hitting me on the side of the head. And I was out like a light 
concussion number two. Anyway, so that she, she knocked me down and out, and boy, I learned to behave and was quiet when I got on the bus. When, when I remember getting on the bus. But anyway, so, um, but she, you know, she had her way about taking care of things too. Um, so th that, that, that would be the number three. Now I'll come up on, I'll come up on uh, number four. And we'll look at number four, you know, that work extremely hard. There is no job too big or no job too small. And I cannot emphasize that. And I, I've seen it, uh, I saw it just as early as a couple of days ago when someone I, I was witnessing at a, at a job, the supervisor said, could you go do such and such? And he actually said, well, that's, you know, kind of like below me or beneath me or whatever. And I'm going like, just do the work. Just do the work. It's not that difficult. Just do the work. And so and I got my first job at age eight. I sorted beer bottles. Like, there, were, there were green bottles, and no, not green bottles. There was brown bottles and white bottles. And I, my job was to take the cases and put all the white bottles in one case and all the brown bottles in another. And why was that the way, done that way? In Canada, they did house deliveries for beer. 110 house deliveries per day my father did of beer deliveries and I worked on the truck on the weekends on Saturday and sorted out beer bottles and that was that was my first job you know and then I you know other things I did I delivered groceries um, on a bicycle without the speed shifts or any of those kinds of things um, I peeled potatoes for a Chinese restaurant and I didn't get paid for it but I got a bag of french fries and a bag at the end of every session hours of peeling french fries and they'd give me a bag of chips and that would be what my, my compensation for it because there's no way we could afford chips. Um, I worked in a variety store where the guy was a bookie and I got to deliver the um, uh, money back to, to Minto Street <laughs> um, after my shift was over. I bagged groceries. I was a shelf stalker. I worked as a gas station attendant. I was a school janitor. I cleaned floors. Um, I worked in a clothing store. That's where I got you know all this good choice of styling clothes, clothes and, and, and did all of those things. So there isn't, there isn't a job that is, that is too big. There isn't a job that is too small. So let's go over the first four and then you know, we'll, uh, we'll do, the, we'll do the, fir the two first four and we'll do a break. So now, number one is never take credit for your successes. And I never do. It's always someone else behind you who helps you do it, whether it be your parents or your brothers or the, your fellow workers. They're the ones. Give them the credit. Number two, honesty, integrity. That reputation follows you everywhere. You build that reputation and boy, it's terrific. Number three, what goes around comes around, but it's over time. Don't expect the immediate reward tomorrow. And then number, number four, work extremely hard. And there is no job too small and there is no job too big that you cannot do. So those are my four. We're going to take a break now and we'll go pay some bills. We'll talk about Angus in a second and what his role in, is in all of this. But anyway, thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you in about a minute. Hello, my name is Crystal. Let me tell you, my talk show, I'm all about health. It's healthy to talk about sex. It's healthy to talk about things that people don't talk about. It's healthy to discuss things that you think are unhealthy because you need to talk about it. So I welcome you to watch Quok Talk and engage in some provocative discussions on things that do relate to healthy issues and have a well-balanced attitude in life. Join me. Aloha. I'm Reg Baker, the host of Business in Hawaii that broadcasts live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30. Today we were very fortunate enough to have a Dr. Miller and her service dog, Muffin. Uh, we talked about the ADA and we covered some of the different do's and don'ts of having service dogs in your establishment uh, and how to sniff out the fakes. Please uh, tune in for Business in Hawaii on Thursday to find out all about service dogs. Aloha. Hi, and how you doing? Welcome back to Yubachi Talk. Gordo the Techs are here. I'm on my own today, and uh, we're going through um, the success factors that I've had in my life that have helped me become what I consider to be uh, rather successful. I'm 
passing them on to you, and hopefully you'll be able to take the, some of these to heart. I've got to start this number, the second segment off with a comment that someone gave to me. Uh, every moment in your life is an opportunity, and that really is true. If you think about it, it's such a simple sentence. Every moment in your life is an opportunity. My opportunities come all the time. You know, doing this show is an opportunity, and things that have led up to it. Uh, meeting people like Jay and, uh, and such who, who have helped us along the way. So anyway, let's talk about success factor number five, which is one of my favorites, and that is have fun. You really need to have fun. I love to laugh, and I love to make people laugh. You know, it was one of the problems I had in school. Um, I wasn't exactly a great student. Um, and my father you know, made things pretty clear. He's like, Arkain didn't go to college. So he, university wasn't even on our plate um, uh, when we were growing up. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, the fact that I graduated from high school was a first for the family. So um, it, that was something that was, that was not really pushed for us. But one of the things, my, and Angus is kind of a, he's kind of like my dad, and same height by the look of this way he's sitting here, but he's kind of like my dad in, in a way. He's like, I reincarnate, reincarnate my dad in him because my dad used to make me every Sunday morning read the Scottish newspapers. He used to get them sent by mail from Scotland, and he would make me read them in the Scottish dialect. And if I didn't, if I didn't get it right, I get a skate in the lug, which is a slap in the side of the head. So he would, he he loved that country, and I think he really wanted to go back. I not think I know he did, but he wanted, he he loved that country so much he needed to hear the Scottish accent, and he so he was the one that helped me kind of hang on to that kind of thing. And I've got some, so so we'll talk about you know having fun. I'm going to give you some funny stories about my folks. So I, there's an, there's another story of my dad. So. One time we got um, uh, a new pair of shoes. I got a new pair of shoes. And we were walking along the street, and with, I had these new shoes on. And he looked at me and said, Hey there, lad, are those your new shoes? And I said, Yes. He said, you know, do, me, do, do me a favor, take bigger strides. They'll last a little bit longer. So, I mean, he'd, he'd be that kind of thing. He'd be that pretty cheap. Now, I, I can tell you some stories about how cheap he, cheap he was. Now, um, he, was, he was so frugal that um, they reused tea bags. They would take tea bags and they would hang them out on the clothesline to let them dry so they could use them to make tea the next day. That was the kinds of things he did. He also, and I'm, they might strike this from the show, he also reused his condoms and he washed those and hung them on the clothesline as well. So imagine what I felt like growing up having to deal with that. The company Christmas party where he was working, they'd give us a Christmas gift. He'd take it back and said we couldn't get it until Santa came. And that would be our big Christmas gift that would come every Christmas. Um, house, you know, we, you know, we, back when we were growing up, we had milk was delivered to your house and um, on, the, on the top of the milk, the cream would settle. He would take the, that, the pog off the top, scoop that cream off it and eat it and put the thing back down. That was his breakfast. That was how he would get, get through the day. Um, they would, they would um, um, fine you if you passed gas at the dinner table. A penny, and you had to put it in the jar. He ended up taking all the money and used it at the bar, the bugger. But, you know, that's just the kind of thing that they would do to us. And that's where you get Angus saying, let your wind gang free where you be. So that was another phrase that came from my dad. Um, we used to, we, my brothers and I used to throw food at each other. You know, the mushy carrots and mushy peas that we hated, we would be flicking them at each other, th those kinds of things. And I, and I remember when I be started to become a teenager, my, my father was really struggling with the long hair and all kinds of things. And I was going to a party and I had blue jeans on. And he looked at me and he went, yeah, then I'm going to wear blue jeans to a party. And he refused to let me get out of the house wearing blue jeans. I had to go put slacks on. Then I got out of the house, and then I had my brothers throw my blue jeans out the window so I could wear my jeans and go to the party because I wasn't going to wear slacks. Don't wear slacks. And, you know, and, and, and growing up in the, in, the, in the 60s made it more, I think, more of a, more of a challenge uh, for him because that was the time when everything started to get very rebellious. Um, my father and I had a falling out, but, you know, but rest his soul, we, you know, that, that was all made amends over the years when I got older. Um, but um, it, it was tough. It was really tough. And I still remember, um, because he was in World War II and went through a lot, um, and they call it post-traumatic stress syndrome now, but back in my day, it was called shell shock. He had been bombed so much that um, there would be times when he would relapse and go back into um, fighting the war again. He'd wake up in the middle of the night and turn the bed upside down and, and believe he was um, uh, back in the foxholes fighting, this, fighting the war. And I, I can remember my brothers and I, and 
holding him, you know, getting him held down and getting him to the hospital and all this kinds of stuff. That stuff never, ever, ever left him. Um, but, you know, but still, we still kept persevering. We still kept going and so on. And one of the things that my parents wanted to do in life, it's funny, their goal was to get into government housing. That was their, we, I went to 11 different public schools and, and such, and I'll talk about that in a second. But so, so success factor number six, surround yourself with people smarter than, your, than you. Now, I was not, and still am not, the brightest star in the sky. Um, but what I learned along the way was I was able to surround myself with a lot of very smart people. And that's, you know, Andrew and Christine Lanning are a perfect example of that. These are two very young entrepreneurial people who um, uh, have made a really great career out of their business they started up. I remember when they started it up and how hard they worked together on it. You know, and so, so again, coming back to that, you know, I surround, I've been able to surround myself with all kinds of people. So I, like I said, I went to 11 different public schools, 11 different public schools. The longest public school I went to was high school for four years. So you can imagine all the years before that and the times that I bounced around. And, you know, and, and in those days, um, uh, when you went to a new school, you know, there was obviously no internet, you know, no Facebook. You dealt with the real bullies. Those were the ones that would test you out when you got there. And so it was never, I, every time I went to a new school, I knew I was going to get into a fight. And during those times, I mean, coming back to the dentist thing, I, you know, I think I was in grade five when I lost half my front teeth in a, in a fight at the school. And now we had no money, and my father went, hey, you lost the fight, tough, you're stuck. So from fifth grade all the way up to high school, I had only half my front teeth. You know, how much does that build confidence in you? So, so I had to find ways to do things to make, make up for it, and one was being kind of like the class clown or having fun with things and so on. And I ended up getting the nickname of Gorgeous because I've had, my face was so messed up and so on. Everybody at school used to call me Gorgeous. It was the weirdest, weirdest thing of all. But we played on it and just managed to have fun with it. Um, so, so that happened. Now, what I did was um, I, there was no way I was going to go to high school with... Um, no teeth and half my teeth gone. So I, I, I worked multiple jobs, saved up. It was $100. That was a lot of money back in those days. 100 bucks, saved it all up, went um, to a, a, a dentist, still remember his name, um, where he yanked out all the, all the broken teeth and stuffed a, a partial plate, not, not your implants or anything, stuffed the partial plate in there and said, okay, don't take this thing out for a week. And, I, so, and that was it. And, and those days, um, they would gas you to take out your teeth. And I still remember they gassed me, and when I woke up, I had um, um, uh, no recollection of anything. They were, they were panicking because I think they couldn't get me, they couldn't arouse me. I was bleeding like a stuffed pig, and they just, they just um, uh, uh, were in a state of shock. So, um, so you've got to surround yourself with smart people. So the, 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 the other thing you need to do is, um, uh, once I finished, um, was, was in school and those kinds of things, high school had a great time. I played football on the high school football team. Uh, was, um, uh, uh, our, our, our high school was the um, championship in our, in our division, two years, last two years that I got to play. Um, I got to play in the All-Star game in my last year in high school. I even got to play football a little bit for two years after I finished, I finished high school. And, um, and then, then I, um, uh, the real world set in because Arakain didn't go to university. I had to get a real job and I got a real full-time job and I was working for the city and county of Toronto um, delivering mail and I was in the buildings department. Now, when I was in the buildings department, what I did was um, uh, surround myself with smart people, but at the same time, I was in planning and permitting, and I decided to go to night school and took architectural classes and how to read plans and so on. So that started it to go there. Now, while I was there, I uh, was able to uh, get into the uh, city's computer system um, illegally. It was before the hacker term was, ter was, was coined, and I got caught. The end result, to make a long story short, was they offered me a job. Uh, in the computer department at the city, so I went down and started working in there, and then I started going to night school and taking computer classes. And back in those days, there was no degree in computer science or MIS or anything like that, like those kinds of things. But I volunteered to work the midnight shift as well because I could get the work done, and I would have this large multi-million dollar mainframe to myself for about four or five hours. And I'd learned to, I wrote code and learned to do a number of things and such like that, which also led to the, um, the, uh, the next part, which is an, um, 
uh, my move to Hawaii. So my next success factor is kind of, I call it, call it be nice. And um, when, I, when I got to move to Hawaii, I got to move to Hawaii because I um, uh, Bank of Hawaii was looking for someone that knew how to make computers talk to each other. And uh, I applied for the position and uh, I wanted a green card and they said, that's all I wanted was the green card. And they said, we'll get you your green card. 11 months later, I've got, um, I'm here in Hawaii. I moved, moved here in January with 500 bucks and uh, my family. And um, we land here and it's just beautiful weather. It's terrific. I'm now working for Bank, Bank of Hawaii. And then um, uh, the, through this thing, I started to do a whole bunch of other things. And that was volunteering. Uh, I got with the bank, I volunteered with um, a number of the things that they had going, and I w ended up working for a number of companies, Queens Medical Center, uh, 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 Campbell Estate and such. You know, the Santa suit one was I volunteered to be Santa. When Coppola was just being developed, I was working for the for um, James Campbell Company at the time. I volunteered to be Santa every Christmas. We'd do 700 photos for free at the Coppola Shopping Center. And I would sit there all day. I'd go through two suits because they'd be so sweaty. I'd go two, two suits and we would take, take photos day after day after day. And I can still remember this one lady, and I think it was in around the last, the last time that I did it. She came in and she said, it's the same Santa. She had pictures of her kids with the same Santa for over seven years. So, but that, that volunteering stuff and that being nice, that, that comes around uh, and those kinds of things. So, and then, then I'm going to hit the last one and I'll call it, we'll call it closing circles. And you've got to close the circles. You start doing all of these things from the beginning to the end, whether it be, you know, you know, your family, your friends, the people you meet and so on. When I first moved to Hawaii, I didn't realize until I got here, my goodness, there's a lot of Asians living here. Um, I, I was like, wow, I've never seen that many Asia, Asians. As a matter of fact, there's more Asians here than I am. I think I might be a minority, which was also kind of like, wow, how amazing is that? But it made it real comfortable when they gave me a Chinese name, Hao Li. Anyway, I'll just leave that one alone. Anyway, so that, that was my, um, that was my um, uh, part of coming in and closing circles and, and always thanking and g giving everybody a chance to um, contribute to your life and at the same time you give back. And the other thing that I love to do and I encourage you to do, I had great mentors when I was growing up and here. I, I mentor now when I, when I, uh, with a number of individuals across this state. So those are, my eight, those are my eight success factors. You can go back and you can revisit this and play it again. My favorite thing, again, every moment in your life is an opportunity. Every moment in your life is an opportunity. And as we like to say, please come and see us again. Uh, watch us on Hey You Talk. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Zuri. Everybody for helping me get through this. Um, we've done it really well. And as we always say at the end of every show, how you doing? <laughs>